This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 6 But let us even suppose that the government were not in any case a privileged class, and could survive without creating around itself a new privileged class, and remain the representative, the servant, as it were, of the whole society. What useful purpose could this possibly serve? How and in what way would this increase the strength, the intelligence, the spirit of solidarity, the concern for the well-being of all and the end of future generations, which, it, which at any given time happened to exist in a given society? It was always the old question of the bound man having, to, having managed to live in spite of his bonds because he lives, thinks he lives because of them. We are used to living under a government which takes over all that energy, intelligence, and will which it can direct for its own ends, and it hinders, paralyzes, and suppresses those who do not serve its purpose or are hostile, and we think that everything that is done in society is carried out thanks to the government, and that without the government there would no longer be any energy, intelligence, and goodwill left in society. Thus, as we have already pointed out, the landowner who has seized the lands gets others to work for it in his profit, leaving the worker with the bare necessity so that he can and will want to go on working, and the enslaved worker imagines that he cannot live without the master, as if the latter had created the land and the forces of nature. What can government itself add to the moral and material forces that exist in society? Would it be a similar case to that of the God of the Bible who creates from nothing? Since nothing is created in and is usually called the material world, so nothing is created in, in this more complicated form of the material world, which is the social world. And so the rulers can only make use of the forces that exist in society, except for those great forces which governmental action paralyzes and destroys, and those rebel forces and all that is wasted through conflicts inevitably tremendous losses in such an artificial system. If they contribute something of their own, they can only do so as men and not as rulers. And of those material and moral forces which remain at the disposal of the government, only a minute part is allowed to play a really useful role for society. The rest is either used up in repressive actions to keep rebel forces in check, or is otherwise diverted from its ends of the general good and used to benefit a few at the expense of the majority of the people. Much has been said about the respective roles of individual initiative and social action in the life and progress of human societies. And by the usual tricks of language and metaphysics, the issues have become so confused that in the end, those who declare that everything is maintained and kept going in the human world thanks to an individual uh, initiative appear as radicals. In fact, this is a common sense truth which is obvious the moment one tries to understand the significance of words. The real being is man, the individual. Society or the collectivity and the state or government which it claims to represent, if it is not a hollow abstraction, must be made up of individuals. And it is in the organism of every individual that all thoughts and human actions inevitably have their origin. And from being individual, they become collective thoughts and acts when they are or become accepted by many individuals. Social action, therefore, is neither the negation nor the complement of individual initiative, but is the resultant of initiatives, thoughts, and actions of all individuals who make up society. A resultant which all other things being equal, is greater or smaller depending on whether individual forces are directed to a common objective or are divided uh, and antagonistic. And if instead, as do the authoritarians, one means government action when one talks of social action, then this is still the resultant of individual forces, but only of those individuals who form the government, who by reason of their position can influence the policy of the government. Therefore, in an age-long struggle between liberty and authority, or in other words, between socialism and a class state, the question is not really one of changing the relationships between society and the individual, nor is it a question of increasing the independence of the individual at the expense of social interference or vice versa, but rather is it a question of preventing some individuals from oppressing others, of giving all individuals the same rights and the same means of action, and of replacing the initiative of the few, which inevitably results in the oppression of everybody else. It is after all a question of destroying once and for all the domination and exploitation of man by man so that everyone can have a stake in the commonwealth, 
uh, and individual forces, instead of being destroyed or fighting amongst themselves or being cut off from each other, will find the possibility of complete fulfillment and come together for the greater benefit of everybody. Even if we pursue our hypothesis of ideal government of the authoritarian socialist, it follows from what we have said that far from resulting in an increase in the productive, organizing, and protective forces of society, it will greatly reduce them, limiting initiative to a few and giving them the right to do everything without, of course, being able to provide them with the gift of being all-knowing. Indeed, if you take out from the law and the entire activity of our government, all that exists to defend the privileged minority and which represents the wishes of the latter themselves, what is left which is not the result of the action of everybody? Sismondi said that, quote, the state is always a conservative power which legalizes, regularizes, and organizes the victories of progress, uh, end quote. And history adds that it is, history adds that it directs them for its own ends and that of the privileged class. Oh, continuing the quote, uh, but never, never introduces them. These victories are always started down below. They are born in the heart of society from individual thought, which is then spread far and wide, becomes opinion, the majority, but in, in its making... But in making its way, it must always meet with and combat the powers that be tradition, habit, privilege, and error. End quote. Anyway... In order to understand how a society can live without government, one has only to observe in depth the existing society and one will see in fact the greater part, the important part of social life is discharged even today outside government intervention and that government only interferes in order to exploit the masses to defend the privileged minority and moreover it finds itself sanctioning quite ineffectually all that has been done without its intervention and often in spite of and even against it. Men work, barter, study, travel, and follow to the best of their knowledge, moral rules, and those of well-being. They benefit from the advances made in science and the arts, have widespread relations among them, all without feeling the need for somebody to tell them how to behave. Indeed, it is just those matters over which government has no control that work best, that give rise to less controversy and are resolved by general consent so that everybody feels happy as well as being useful. Nor is the government specially needed for the large-scale enterprises and public services requiring the full-time employment of a large number of people from different countries and conditions. Thousands of these undertakings are even today the result of individual associations freely constituted and are by common accord those that work best. Uh, nor are we talking of capitalist associations organized for the purpose of exploitation, however much they do to sh they do to demonstrate the potentialities and the power of a free association and how it can spread to include people from every country as well as a vast and contrasting interests. But rather, let us talk about the associations which, inspired by a love of one's fellow beings or by a passion for science or more simply by the desire to enjoy oneself and to be applauded, are more representative of the groupings as they will be in a society in which, having abolished private property, uh, and an internecine struggle between men, everybody will find his interests in that of everybody else and his greatest satisfaction in doing good and in pleasing others. Scientific societies and congresses, the International Life-Saving Association, the Red Cross, the geographical societies, the workers' organizations, the voluntary bodies that rush to help whenever there are great public disasters are few examples among many of the power of the spirit of association, which always manifests itself when it is a question of a need or an issue deeply felt, and the means are not lacking. If the voluntary association is not worldwide and does not embrace all of the material and moral aspects of activity, it is because of the obstacles put in its path by governments, by the dissensions created by by private property and the importance and discouragement felt by most people as a result of the seizure of all wealth by a few. For instance, the government takes over the responsibilities of postal services, the railways, and so on. But in what way does it help those these services? When the people are enabled to enjoy them and feel the need for these services, they think about organizing them, and the technicians do not need a government license to get to work. 
And the more they need, the more the need is universal and urgent, the more volunteers will be there to carry it out. If the people had the power to deal with the problems of production and food supplies, oh, have no fear, they might just die of hunger waiting for a government to make the necessary laws to deal with the problem. If there had to be a government, it would still be obliged to wait until the people had organized everything in order then to come along with the laws to sanction and exploit what had already been done. It is demonstrated that private interest is the great incentive for all activities. Well, when the interest of all will be that of each individual, and this would be obvious, obviously be the case if private property did not exist, then everyone will act. And if we do things now, which only interest a few, we will do them then much better and more intensively when they will be of interest to everybody. And it is difficult to understand why there should be people who believe that the carrying out and the normal functioning of public services vital to our daily lives would be more reliable if carried out under the instructions of a government rather than by the workers themselves who, by direct election or through agreements made with others, have chosen to do that kind of work and carry it out under the direct control of all of the interested parties. Of course, in every large collective undertaking, a division of labor, technical management, administration, and etc. is necessary. But authoritarians clumsily play on words to produce a reason for government out of the very real need for the organization of work. Government, it is well to repeat, is the concourse of individuals who have had or have seized the right and the means to make laws and to oblige people to obey. The administrator, the engineer, etc. instead are people who are appointed or assume the responsibility to carry out a particular job and do so. Government means the delegation of power, that is the abdication of initiative and sovereignty of all into the hands of a few. Administration means the delegation of work, that is tasks to be given and receive free exchange of services based on free agreement. The governor is a pri privileged person since he has the right to command others and to make use of the efforts of others to make his ideas and his personal wishes prevail. The administrator, the technical director, etc. are workers like the rest that it is, of course, in a society in which everyone has equal means to develop um, and that are all or can be at the same time intellectual and manual workers, and that the only differences remaining between men are those which stem from the natural diversity of aptitudes and all that and all that jobs, all functions, give an equal right to the enjoyment of social possibilities. Let one not confuse the function of government with that of an administration, for they are essentially different. And if today the two are often confused, it is only because of an economic and political privilege. But let us hasten to pass on the functions for which government is considered by all who are not anarchists as quite indispensable. The internal and external defense of a society, that is to say war, the police, and justice. Once governments have been abolished and the social wealth has been put to the disposal of everybody, then all the antagonisms between people will soon disappear and war will no longer have a reason. We, have, we would have... We would add, furthermore, that in the present state of the world, when a revolution occurs in one country, if it does not have a speedy repercussions elsewhere, it will, however, meet with much sympathy everywhere. So much so that no government will dare to send its troops abroad for fear of having a revolutionary uprising on its own doorstep. But, by all means, let us admit that the governments of the still unemancipated countries were to want to and could attempt to reduce free people to a state of slavery once again would this would these people require a government to defend itself to wage war men are needed who have the necessary geographical and mechanical knowledge and above all large masses of the population willing to go and fight a government can neither increase the abilities of the former nor the will and courage of the latter. The experience of history teaches that pe teaches us that a people who really want to defend their own country are invincible. And in Italy, everyone knows that before the Corps of Volunteers, anarchist formations, thrones topple, and regular armies composed of conscripts or mercenaries disappear. And what of the police and of justice? Many suppose that if there were no carabiners, policemen, and judges, everyone would be free to kill, to ravish, to harm others as the mood took one, and that anarchists, in the name of their principles, 
would wish to see that strange liberty respected which violates and destroys the freedom and life of others. They seem almost to believe that after having brought down government and private property, we would allow both to be quietly built up again because of respect for the freedom of those who might feel the need to be rulers and property owners. A truly curious way of interpreting our ideas. Of course, it is easier to brush them off with a shrug of the shoulders than to take the trouble of confusing them. The freedom we want for ourselves and for others is not an absolute metaphysical abstract freedom, which in practice is inevitably translated into the oppression of the weak, but it is, but it is a real freedom, possible freedom, which is the conscious community of interests and voluntary solidarity. We proclaim the maxim, do as you wish, and with it we almost summarize our program, for we maintain, and it doesn't take much to understand why, that in a harmonious society, in a society without government and without property, each one will want what he must do. But supposing that as a result of the kind of education received from present society or the physical misfortune or for any other reasons, someone were to want to do harm to us and to others, one can be sure that we would exert ourselves to prevent him from doing so with all the means at our disposal. Of course, because we know that man is the consequence of his own organism as well as the cosmic and social environment in which he lives because we do not confuse the inviolate right of defense with the claimed ridiculous right to punish and since with the de, uh, and since with the delinquent that is he who commits antisocial acts we would not to be sure see the rebel slave as happens with judges today would be the sick brother needing treatment so would we not introduce hatred in the repression and would make every effort not to go beyond the needs of defense and would not think of avenging ourselves but of seeking to cure redeem the unhappy person with all the means that science offered us in any case, irrespective of the anarchist's interpretation, who could, as happens with the, all the theorists, lose sight of reality in pursuing a semblance of logic, it is certain that the people would not allow their well-being and their freedoms to be attacked with impunity. And if the necessity arose, they would take measures to defend themselves against the antisocial tendencies of a few. But to do so, what purpose is served by people whose profession is the making of laws, while other people spend their lives seeking out and inventing lawbreakers? When the people really disapprove of something and consider it harmful, they always manage to prevent it more successfully than, than do the professional legislators, police, and judges. When in the course of insurrections that people have, however mistakenly, wanted, to, wanted private property to be respected, they did so in a way that an army of policemen could not. Customs always follows the needs and feelings of the majority, and the less they are subject to the sanctions of law, the more are they respected, for everyone can see and understand their use, and because the interested parties, having no illusions as to the protection offered by government, themselves see to it that they are respected. For a caravan traveling across the deserts of Africa, the good management of water stocks is a matter of life and death for all, and in those circumstances, water becomes a sacred thing, and no one would think of wasting it. Conspirators dispen depend on secrecy, and the secret is kept, or abomination strikes whoever violates it. Gambling debts are not secured by law, and among gamblers, whoever does not pay up is considered uh, and considers himself di dishonored. It is perhaps because of the uh, the police force that people are are not killed. Most of the villages in Italy, the armed forces are only seen from time to time. Millions of people cross the mountains and pass through the countryside far from the protecting eye of authority, such that one could strike them down without the slightest risk of punishment. Yet they are no less safe than those who live in the most protected areas. And statistics show that the number of crimes is hardly affected by repressive measures, whereas it changes dramatically with the changes in economic conditions and in the attitudes of public opinion. Anyway, punitive laws are are only concerned with exceptional and unusual occurrences. Daily life carries on beyond the reach of the of the codicil and is controlled almost unconsciously with the tacit and voluntary agreement of all by a number of usages and customs which are uh, much more important to the social life than the articles of the penal code and better respected in spite of being completely free from any sanction other than the natural one of the dis of the disesteem in which those who violate them are held and the consequences that arise therein 
And when differences were to arise between men, would not arbitration voluntarily accepted or pressure of public opinion be perhaps more likely to establish where the right lies than through an irresponsible magistrate, which has the right to adjudicate on everything and everybody and is inevitably incompetent and therefore unjust? Since, generally speaking, a government only exists to protect the privileged classes, so the police and the magistrature exists only to punish those crimes which are not so considered by the public and only harm the privileges of the government and of property owners. There is nothing more pernicious for the real defense of society, for the defense of the well-being and freedom of all, than setting up of these classes which exists on the pretext of defending everybody, but become accustomed to consider every man as game to be caged and strike at you without knowing why, by orders of a chief whose irresponsible mercenary ruffians they are. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.